in. There we go. So now we are recording. Um, I just got a question about um, materials. Um, after the session, we'll be sending out an email um, with a copy of the PowerPoint from today, a copy of the recording of the webinar, as well as um, any other material and a uh, survey um, as well. So that information should all be going out to you after the webinar today. Um, this is our, actually we've just moved uh, to this WebEx format. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I believe there's a chat box that you can uh, send me messages privately or to the whole group. Um, and speaking of me, I might as well introduce myself. Um, my name is Josh Weinberg. I am the legal training manager here at the Center for Public Health Law Research. Um, so in the course of my duties, along with doing policy surveillance, I am also manage our training program, including these sessions, our summer institute, and any other um, technical assistance or training that any of our clients might need. So if you have any policy surveillance projects that you'll be working on in the future or you are hoping to work on, feel free to reach out to me or anyone here at the center and we'll be able to help you out in that process, which we are going to might as well get into now. Um, so as I said, this is the Introduction to Policy Surveillance uh, webinar. We are going to discuss the methods, significance, and the process of policy surveillance um, and hopefully give everyone some context on policy surveillance and how it can fit and, and how you can use it. So today, our learning objectives for the day are listed here. Um, we are going to define legal epidemiology. We will define the different forms of legal mapping. Um, and we will learn the steps of policy, the policy surveillance process. Um, again, as I said before, this is the introductory session. So over the course of this next hour up until about noon, um, we're going to be going over all of the steps of policy surveillance. Um, in a not super detailed way. Um, as I said just before, we have an advanced session, um, advanced series of webinars, which will dive into each step of the process that we're going to discuss today with its own hour-long webinar. So as you'll soon see, the first step in policy surveillance is, um, is of course, uh, uh, defining the scope and so, and conducting background research. So, for example, we're going to talk about that today and talk about it in some detail, but not as much detail as next week's session at this same time, the same place, um, on basically an hour of in-depth training on defining the scope and conducting background research. So, let's get going then in that case. So, First thing is lawatlas.org. Um, that's us. So just to give you an overview of who we are, who the Center for Public Health Law Research is, um, who Law Atlas is, who the Policy Surveillance Program is. The Policy Surveillance Program is a part of the Center for Public Health Law Research. Um, we are a organization that's housed at Temple University Beasley School of Law um, here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Lawatlas.org is our website that is a central place for creating, sharing, and accessing um, all of our health policy surveillance resources and research. Um, that includes in our Explore the Law section, as you can see, this is a screenshot of our website, um, FYI. Uh, under the Explore the Law section, you can look at, go through and visit all of our projects that we published on there. All of our projects um, as part of our mission um, are freely available on our website, um, including interactive maps that you would be able to go to and um, explore the different data sets, their specific questions, the way they break down the law into its components and parts and elements, as long with, as long, in addition, we have for freely available download, um, all of the data files that have all of the results of our research along with the, um, the research protocol that explains our methods and any, any decisions that were made in the course of our research as well as, well as our essential information, the landing text, 
anything else that we require for the publication of a policy surveillance project, all of our projects are available on lawless.org with all of those resources. Additionally, we have the learning library on, um, on the website, which has uh, detailed pow uh, versions and PowerPoints and YouTube videos of our process. Um, basically, versions of these webinars are available for your reference um, on our learning library website, along with um, some papers uh, that Professor Scott Burris has written on, who um, was the founder of our center, who has written about the significance of the policy surveillance process. Um, there are also journal articles, law review articles on there um, with, that have used our um, processes and our data um, as well. And then we also have a, a nice about us section, which will just explain the fact of who is at the policy surveillance project um, and our work here. Our goal is, um, as a center, is to increase the use of legal epidemiology, which we will define shortly, um, and to build a transdisciplinary community of individuals interested in laws that influence health and public health outcomes. Um, our mission is to teach methods and freely share our tools, related resources, and experiences. So let's talk about what we're here to talk about today, legal mapping in transdisciplinary public health law. So legal mapping is our term for any process that assesses and captures important features and variations in laws and policies across time and space. Um, there are two primary forms of legal mapping that we work in, uh, legal epidemiology and public health law practice. Legal epidemiology uses a more rigorous scientific approach um, as you'll see in this process, uh, and more resources to deliver projects with an emphasis on quality control. You'll find as we discuss um, this process in depth over the course of this webinar that quality control pervades every aspect of the policy surveillance process, and that is what brings it to that higher level over um, legal mapping and public health law practice, which uses traditional legal research skills to answer questions efficiently with more limited resources. Within um, legal epidemiology, there we conduct policy surveillance as well as legal assessments. And within public health law practice, um, is the, the actual products are legal scans and legal profiles. Um, to get into more detail of what each of those terms mean, we have a handy chart on this next slide explaining the legal mapping models. Um, so this table breaks down these four uh, models of legal mapping. Um, and we can note that under legal epidemiology, uh, policy surveillance and legal assessments both produce robust data using a rigorous scientific process. The difference is in terms of um, the time and place studied. Uh, with policy surveillance, we're tracking laws over time and across multiple jurisdictions. Um, that's opposed to legal assessments where we're going to be looking at um, laws one at a time at a specific point in time across multiple jurisdictions. So basically the idea is that policy surveillance looks at how the law changes over time um, using our scientific methods while legal assessments look at how laws are different across jurisdictions at one singular point in time. Um, also using our essential team resources of usually about three team members um, to really do the uh, policy surveillance methods that we discuss. Um, that's opposed to legal scans and legal profiles, which still produce um, quick scans of a topic or domain, um, can produce its own data. Um, <clears throat> but the idea here is that they're mapping in a legal scan, laws across multiple jurisdictions at one specific point in time, while a legal profile will um, look at one specific jurisdiction at one specific point in time, but neither of them are going to be looking at um, changes in law across jurisdictions and across time. And additionally, because these don't require the same resources and have the same uh, rigorous scientific processes that are required of legal epidemiology, um, they can be completed by one person and often are. These are the type of things that you'll see a lot of times um, produced by a lot of organizations um, who aren't using our policy surveillance methods. Um, 
maybe in sort of a, a legal scan in a chart kind of format, or maybe a quick map showing whether a law exists in one place or another, um, as opposed to the product that we get to, which you'll see as we move forward. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions as we go through this, feel free to send me a chat, I believe, um, and I should be able to respond most likely to the question at large. Um, so we're going to play a quick game to uh, review um, the legal mapping models that we just, just discussed. Um, so this legal mapping model, this legal mapping project, um, <laughs> compares tobacco policies in multiple cities within a county at one point in time. Um, the researchers published a research protocol and used heightened quality control standards. Um, and so because of that, this would qualify as a legal assessment. Um, again, that is because they've used our rigorous scientific processes, uh, published these research protocols, but um, we're, and, and look at laws um, across different jurisdictions. Here we're looking at um, multiple cities within a single county, but we're looking at that at one point in time. So this would qualify as a legal assessment as opposed to um, a policy surveillance project. On this next example, um, this project compares medical marijuana laws across all 50 states and over time. Um, it lists a research protocol and heightened quality control standards. Um, and this is an example of a policy surveillance project. Um, really the difference between this one and the last one is that it will, um, it's looking at these laws across a certain specified time period. So as you can see in this picture, this shows that in 2016, these 25 states met this criteria. The idea is that this project shows which states meet these criteria across this timeline, not just in 2016. Um, this, actually, if you are interested, um, this is hosted on pdaps.org, which is the uh, um, website that, of an organization that we work with, Legal Science, um, that is producing their own policy surveillance and uh, legal mapping. Uh, here, we have a project comparing multiple jurisdictions' policies on emergency hospitalization for evaluation at one specific point in time. Um, they didn't publish a research protocol um, or specified any quality control standards, and this information is presented in the table format you see here. So from this information, we would refer to this as a legal scan. Um, this is looking at multiple jurisdictions at one point in time, but not using and the, uh, the rigorous standards of the policy surveillance legal epidemiology process. Um, this is a more traditional legal research method. So um, now that we hopefully understand the different legal mapping models, um, we're going to dive into what we all came to talk about today, the one most rigorous legal mapping model, um, policy surveillance. So why policy surveillance matters? Um, policy surveillance um, is the, as I said before, is the systematic scientific collection and analysis of laws and institutional policies of health significance. Um, it's important to note that the policy surveillance process, while we focus on public health um, and laws related to public health outcomes, you can really use these processes and these tools um, to look at policies, laws, whatever, honestly, across any sort of jurisdiction. We generally focus on um, state level. We've been working um, with some um, on a city level more recently, and we've also started working internationally, comparing laws across um, in international countries. Um, but really, you can use this for any type of jurisdiction that you're interested in studying differences and similarities in policies or laws ever you're collecting across those jurisdictions, whether it be, you know, you know, this isn't still in the world of public health, but you could do the same thing for hospital policies in a single county. Um, you know, they're not codified law, but you can use these processes to do that. Um, our work focuses on laws that are significant um, to public health, but as I said, it can be used for any type of law and policy. And you can adapt what you learn here to fit your needs wherever, whatever they are. Um, and again, we're happy to help you figure out how to use policy surveillance in your research. Um, 
You also note that I might change up, accidentally change up some of the language as we go forward um, and refer to, commonly refer to policy surveillance projects as longitudinal studies um, where they're looking at um, a, cap, a, snap, a capturing of the data across time, so we refer to that as longitudinal as opposed to um, what we refer to additionally as uh, legal assessments which capture a snapshot of law at one point in time, which we also, I might accidentally, because we refer to it here, as a cross-sectional uh, project as well. So hopefully that doesn't make things any more confusing for you. But why is policy surveillance important? Um, because the end result is empirical legal mapping data that can play an important role in improving population health. Um, as I just said, it create as I just said, it creates reliable data for evaluation. Um, the rigorous rigorous regul wow, I can't pronounce that. Um, the detailed produced detailed produced data supports a more nuanced analysis and evaluation than simple observation of whether a law on a cer certain topic exists or not. Um, as you'll see, we're going to be breaking down the law into its components and elements. So it's not just whether the law exists in the states, but what features of the law exist in a state as opposed to what features in the law exist in a different jurisdiction. Um, they, uh, as we create data that can be longitudinal or cross-sectional, um, we also build data that is cross-sectional into longitudinal data over time, um, which allows us to uh, do ongoing monitoring and updating um, and tracking versions of the law relatively um, live uh, in if that project that you're interested in. We can also look at how change law, how laws have changed historically as well. Um, longitudinal policy data supports quasi-experimental and other more rigorous observational designs that better support causal inference than cross-sectional studies. Um, and uh, this longitudinal data can also allow researchers to identify changes in policy over a period of time. Um, we, policy surveillance also supports diffusion of innovation. Uh, jurisdictions that are seeking to address a particular public health issue may use uh, surveillance data to learn what others are doing. Um, it addresses the chronic lack of readily accessible nonpartisan information about trends and status of legislation and policy. And then policymakers can also use policy surveillance data to, um, to see where legislation already exists in an area that they're looking to legislate and what it looks like and how um, they could potentially improve upon it. Um, additionally, in this same idea, it, policy surveillance tracks changes over time and measures progress. Policymakers can see what elements of laws have the most movement in other states, um, what elements of laws don't have movement in other states, also important. Um, advocacy, advocacy groups can track the progress of campaigns and efforts to change laws and determine where to focus their efforts. Social scientists can access scientifically sound data that can be used to evaluate the health influences of law. And government agencies can use policy surveillance as a metric for the success of larger programs. Additionally, um, policy surveillance supports the diffusion of innovative policy ideas. Um, as we said before, policymakers, um, uh, social scientists, advocacy groups can learn to track their own laws, their own um, efforts. Um, for their own accreditation or program purposes. Um, staff and the public itself have easier access to key health laws. Um, we can actually, the public can actually know what the laws on the books are, where they live, and where in, in other jurisdictions and compare them. Um, and and uh, finally, it helps build workforce capacity um, and the idea that this um, this, uh, as I said before, um, knowing the policy terrain can help health professionals measure progress and plan their own initiatives. So let's get into the nitty gritty of policy surveillance. This image that you're seeing here now is the policy surveillance process in totality. Uh, it is a nonlinear process, which is important to note and is why it is in this circle format. Um, Although we might start with defining the scope and end with hopefully publication and dissemination and then tracking and updating the law at a different time, um, it's an iterative process. Uh, once we're never really finished defining the scope, we're never really finished conducting background research, 
while we're coding the law, we might have to go back and change our coding questions, et cetera. Um, and also important to note is the quality control box in the middle and the arrows pointing every which way in the circle. This again notes that quality control pervades every step of this process and is very important to um, creating the rigorous legal data that um, we want out of policy surveillance. So what we're gonna do over the rest of this um, introductory webinar is go over the steps of all these process and discuss them um, in, in some detail, but not as much detail as I said our advanced webinars do. Um, next week at this time, we are going to be having an hour-long webinar only on de defining the scope and conducting background research. And we have a series of five webinars going through the entire policy surveillance process um, if you are so interested in getting into those more, into those, the details of policy surveillance and how to actually do it yourself. So uh, with any project, we're going to start with uh, defining the scope. So scoping, um, what is, scoping asks what is the purpose of the project, what questions are we trying to answer with this data set, who is the audience of our research and our policy surveillance data, and very, very importantly in the outset is we need to decide is this data set going to be cross-sectional or longitudinal? Are we going to look at the laws at the moment in time? It could be now, it could be at a, a date that you decide, or are we looking at it over a specified um, period of time? Um, so for example, uh, we have done projects, uh, I think an example I'll be mentioning a lot is our project on youth concussion laws. Um, so at the start of that, when we're, we're sitting down the scope, we know that we want to generally look at youth concussion laws because there may be a connection between the incidence of youth concussions and these laws. Um, however, after we begin to conduct our background research, we go into what questions we're looking to answer. Um, we might realize that there are already countless uh, reputable concussion studies published and data that's already available. Um, so through that background research we'll discuss in the next, um, in the following slides, we're able to define and redefine our scope um, to make sure that our project is filling in the gaps that exist in the research um, and that it's bringing something to the literature that's um, new and, and particularly useful. Um, so defining and redefining um, again, as I said before, it's important to remember that the scoping process is iterative um, and that it repeats and refines itself as in the same way that many steps in this process um, does. The initial project scope sets the parameters for what we will study. And then as we go through and actually do the project, uh, the, that scope will likely change and be redefined as you do your background research, as you uh, start actually collecting the laws, as you start answering your questions that you've developed with the laws you collect, the scope is gonna change, um, and that's good. It's a good thing. Don't, uh, don't get down on yourself if you're after you have to change your scope after you've started. Um, so, you know, in a, in a project on distracted driving laws, um, we, you know, for example, you may have gone through this whole process, your background research, your question development, and as you're collecting laws and actually looking at the text of these laws across jurisdiction, you note that um, you had only really been asking questions or looking at um, laws that focus on adult drivers, but really you should be capturing also focus on minor drivers as well. So that scope, you'll have to go back, um, redefine your scope once that decision is made, redo some of your background research, some of your question development to match that redefinition of the scope. So that's the first step is defining the scope. Um, so once you have a, an initial scope, you're going to want to conduct background research to help, as I said, redefine that scope. Um, the first step that we take when we um, do our background research is to draft a background memorandum. A background memorandum is a document, as it might imply, that summarizes and synthesizes the information that you've uncovered about the topic's legal landscape. Um, Generally, as I mentioned before, um, we usually have teams of three for our policy surveillance projects. Um, this is adaptable. Uh, you can have more. You can have less. It'll be more difficult with less, um, especially with some of the quality control measures uh, that we're going to be discussing. But the idea here is that in an ideal research team with one supervisor and two researchers, 
Um, one to two of the researchers will each write a background memorandum with the goal of becoming familiar with the topic, finding gaps in already existing resources, discovering unforeseen challenges related to that topic, identifying key trends in the law over time, exploring the legal landscape of the project, identifying the sources of the law, are they, is it statutes, regulations, policies, and how they interact with each other, and as well as identify key elements of the laws that we're studying. Um, for example, as I said in that distracted driving project, you might find that state statutes and regulations dictate distracted driving law in each state. Um, and then you might also find that in every state but Montana, there is a law on cell phone use while driving, while only 36 states um, have a law on minors using cell phone while driving. So this background memorandum, ideally in the end result, will give you a, a, an idea of the landscape of the project and again will help you define and redefine your scope. Um, identify what areas of law are evolving, what areas of the law um, are dormant and potentially might change in the future, and how different jurisdictions approach the same subject. Um, and as I said, um, we generally have two researchers draft the background memo on the same topic. The idea here um, is that we are improving the quality of the background research by having two independent researchers write the same background memo and then comparing their findings on the legal landscape. So that's, once that first step is done and you think you have a general idea of the legal landscape, um, it's time to write another memo. <laughs> um, we're going to now draft what we call a policy memorandum. Uh, a policy memorandum Again, um, we will have one to two researchers, ideally two researchers, um, write this document that summarizes the laws in five jurisdictions that are relevant to the project's topic. Um, so in a, in a project where we're looking at state level, just for ease of example, one to two researchers will research five states each. So one researcher will research, will write this memo on five States, um, and then a sample of five states, um, potentially you might find from your background research which are the best states to look at, look at um, where the most differences and changes are amongst the jurisdictions, and another researcher will write a similar memo, a similar policy memo on a different five jurisdictions or states. Each memo will then identify the source and the structure of the law in each of those jurisdictions, present a sample of the laws relevant to your topic, and identify variations of the law. Um, and again, I keep saying law, statute, states, but again, um, you can do legal mapping at any level, a local level, a global international level, policy, school, school board policies, hospital policies, as I said. Um, but again, you in your background memo, you're identifying the source and structure of the law, and here you're actually diving into the details of um, those laws and sources of policy. Um, the idea here is that after identifying um, the sources of law that, that, are, that are for each of these jurisdictions, you can look at the sample of relevant laws for these five sample jurisdictions. Um, what this will allow you do, allow your team to do is at the end of um, this process of writing, drafting these policy memorandum, memorandi, uh, your team should be able to compare what the law said in each jurisdiction about important elements of the law with what you've identified in your background memorandum. This then will help you identify variations in the law across these jurisdictions and potentially over time. Um, and the idea here is how background research leads to developing coding questions. The idea here is the scoping and the background research, the, as you might remember from that circular image, um, they all lead to one another. So we're doing, we're scoping the project to identify the legal landscape through our background research, um, to identify the key elements of the law and variations in the law, which will then lead to preliminary constructs, which are the source of our question sets. Um, legal constructs, uh, preliminary constructs, are important elements or features of the law that can vary among jurisdictions that we would be interested in in researching for our project. Um, 
So after you've written the background memo and the policy memo, um, the researchers should be able to, and the supervisor who's reviewing these memos, should be able to start developing a preliminary list of constructs that are, or elements of the law in this area that would be important to capture and understand. Um, and then the idea here is these preliminary constructs will allow us to lead directly into writing the questions based on these constructs. Um, so here's an example of a construct that we can find in a distracted driving set. Um, uh, so from our uh, research, we might find the initial constructs that we've observed in the law is all the laws discuss which devices are prohibited, which behaviors are prohibited while driving, the age for the prohibitions um, of, on these behaviors and devices, maybe uh, issues related to the driver's driving record, the types of drivers, as we said, um, adult versus minor drivers and potential um, policy related to each one of those, and then use exceptions. Um, and then the idea here is this list might be huge. Um, you might find from your background research that there are a lot of elements and a lot of features um, of variation in this one topic in the law. Ideally, this will then help us narrow the scope of the project. We can then decide which of these aspects are important or maybe important in terms of uh, research, in terms of filling those gaps of the literature that we found before, um, important in terms of not repeating prior, uh, prior research. And then we can have this final list of constructs that we can then use to develop our coding questions, which is the next step in the process after um, identifying the scope and conducting the background research. So let's talk about drafting coding questions. So once you've identified your constructs, you develop questions from those variables. Um, questions and particular answers may have been added throughout the process to account for unforeseen constructs and answer choices. That's in reference to the fact that, again, this is an iterative process. As you go through this process, you, as you go through your actual collecting and coding of the law later on, you might have to add answer choices, might end up adding questions, um, that that is okay and that will happen. Um, the five-state memorandum, the, five, the policy memorandum will help you develop your responses to the questions. Um, the idea here is that Questions should be observed rather than interpret. We, um, one of our goals here is we want to create data that um, is usable and the, that, is a, that is based on observable features of the law and not based on our researchers' interpretations. The idea then is to do so is we want to create objective questions that can be coded consistently. Um, so this is a quick example of you know, an observation of things we measure, facts versus interpretation, conclusions we derive from those observations. So an example is we would write a question of, is texting while driving illegal in the state as a basic, basic baseline question? That we can, our researchers will be able to find the answer by just observing the law itself. As opposed to a question that asks, does this state have a strict texting ban while driving? This is a problem because what does each researcher might have a different definition of what strict means to them. So you might end up with um, inconsistent coding based on an interpretive question. Other important key features of question writing to note, um, we uh, want to avoid compound questions. Um, again, we want questions that will create um, usable data. If we have compound questions with compound answers, we're going to create data that might end up being a mess and not usable um, with any of the outcome data that we are hoping to use this with. Um, so for example, we're not going to ask, does the state have a law restricting cell phone use or texting while driving? Um, because a state might have a law restricting texting, but not cell phone use generally. So then how would you answer that question? Um, instead, we want to break that question up into two separate questions. One that asks specifically about does the state have a law restricting cell phone use while driving, and one that has a law does the state, sorry, does, one that has the question does the state have a law restricting texting while driving. Um, we also want to avoid text-based responses whenever possible. Um, the idea here is we're going to create um, 
questions, um, not just binary yes or no questions, but also questions that capture the features of the law and the way we do that instead of um, having text boxes that will again lead to inconsistent coding by our coders. We're going to have categorical questions that um, create that will lead to a consistent coding scheme. Um, categorical questions meaning um, if we want to ask um, what what actions are prohibited while driving, I wouldn't have a text box that allows the researcher um, or the coder to just fill out the answer, but have those specific actions listed as answer choices that the coder can select as answer choices. Um, again, this, uh, these categorical questions that break down um, the law into its elements and components allow for easier comparison between the states on a sort of more minute level instead of a just does the law, is there a ban on texting while driving? We can go into and look at which devices does one state prohibit versus which uh, devices does another state prohibit. And that facilitates analysis and comparison to outcome data. Um, some more information on drafting coding questions. Uh, we um, organize our question sets in this way, in a sort of parent, child, grandchild, three-level questions, um, as you can see in the example of the screen. Here we have two constructs um, that are related to each other. So our first construct was specifically related to laws regulating novice drivers. So we want to find out, does this state, does this jurisdiction have a cell phone use law specifically for novice drivers? Um, and if they do, we then will have a follow-up question, which we call a child question, that's only answered in the situation where the parent question is answered yes, asking what behaviors are restricted specifically for novice drivers. Um, in this way, we won't just have a random question in our question set of what behaviors are restricted for novice drivers. We can then have this in a more organized way that will allow, again, for greater um, facilitation of analysis and comparison to outcome data. Um, so we're going to play a quick game, um, more of a uh, of spotting the issue with these questions. So here's a quick one. This is an example uh, question. Is there a law that prohibits novice and experienced drivers from driving while using a cell phone? So we want to know. What is the issue with this question? Um, does it call for interpretation? Is it a compound response, a compound question, unnecessary response, or a good question? Um, we find, we've determined that this is, hopefully you're recognizing the fact that this is a compound question. Um, here we're asking, is there a law that prohibits novice and experienced drivers from driving while using a cell phone? Um, Instead, again, as I said before in the previous example, we would break this up into separate questions um, on novice drivers and a separate question on experienced drivers' um, bans on using cell phones. Another example, uh, let's say we have this question, why are handheld devices restricted? Um, they're hopefully recognizing the issue with this question. Um, besides the fact that this is a text-based response, uh, we don't even have that as a, as a potential answer choice here just because it's, it's so obvious. But the not as obvious answer is that this calls for interpretation. Here, uh, we don't want to have a researcher have to decide, why, why are the legislators um, restricting handheld devices? Maybe they have a, um, a reason stated in the actual law. And if that is something that you would want to capture, um, you would want to write this question in a more um, observable format. But most likely, why um, devices are restricted is not going to be an important element, and it's, and it's going to end up with interpretive, um, not the most useful data in the end. Uh, this question, what is the fine for a first offense? $100, $200, or $300? Um, give you a second to look at these answers. And hopefully, you'll note that this is a good question exactly the type of question we want in our question tables. Um, observable, creating useful data that can be compared across jurisdictions and over time. Uh, another example is this: is the fine for a violation strict. Um, I brought up a similar example earlier, so this 
calls for interpretation. Again, we don't know what um, the coders or the researchers will interpret as strict, um, leading to inconsistent answer, answering of this question across different jurisdictions, leading to inconsistent data that be as useful for, um, for review. Uh, another example question, what are the exceptions in the law? Reporting an emergency, when the vehicle stopped, activating hands-free technology, all of the above, or no exceptions listed in the law. Um, this is actually an example of something we don't do, so this, there is an issue with this question. The issue here is the compound response of all of the above. We do not, as part of the policies rounds process in our question set, have all of the above answer choices. Again, this will produce data that might not be the most useful because when someone, when a researcher ends up with the data file and notes that this answer choice was, was, is all of the above, what is that referring to? All of what above? Um, instead, we will set up this question so that if it really is all of the above, each of the individuals reporting an emergency, when the vehicle stopped, activating hands-free technology, et cetera, can each be individually answered and chosen in a way, it resulting in the same all of the above answer choice, but in a way that will produce usable data. Uh, another example, what are the exceptions in the law? Authorized personnel, bus drivers and taxi drivers, law enforcement and paramedics, reporting an emergency, no exceptions listed in the law. This is an example of, again, a different type of compound response um, where there's actually two answers here that are compound responses in and of themselves, um, bus drivers and taxi drivers and law enforcement and paramedics. This is a situation where you might decide, I don't really care if there are specific exceptions for bus drivers versus taxi drivers. So instead of having a, um, a compound answer choice, you could potentially put something like um, public driver. I don't know the exact term. The exact terminology of what you would call a bus driver, a taxi driver, similar situation for law enforcement and paramedics, you could have an answer choice that is um, labeled emergency personnel that, that captures both of those um, and explain, and this is where the research protocol comes in, you would explain in your research protocol what you meant by that you meant law enforcement or paramedics could be coded under emergency personnel. And in that way, you can capture um, the details of law enforcement paramedics, but without going, without creating a compound response and without any potential confusion in the data and without um, not capturing one of these aspects if you decide that you, it is important to capture them. And again, if you decided you really wanted to know the difference in the laws for law enforcement versus paramedics, you would just separate those into separate answer choices. One more uh, quick spot the issue. Hopefully this is an easy one. Um, is there a state law on self-use while driving, yes or no? This is a good question. This is a basic, very basic format. This potentially would be the first question we asked in a data set on cell phone use while driving. So that is um, collect, uh, sorry, that is question development in a very brief time. Again, we have more detailed um, webinars on this process in and of itself. We have an entire webinar, an entire hour specifically on question development and more resources, resources on lawatlas.org. So now we're going to move on to collecting the law and creating the legal text. Um, this wheel represents the full process for collecting the law. Um, this process is, uh, as it says, is completed in batches of a few jurisdictions at a time. We recommend batches of up to 12, ten, uh, sorry, 10 jurisdictions. This simplifies quality control because issues with the project can then be addressed early on before they affect too many um, jurisdictions. So for example, if you collected your first 10 jurisdictions, you identify the relevant laws, record those citations on the master sheet, and we'll, we'll discuss these steps in detail, um, but you realize that um, you missed something or there's, there is something that needs to be in scope that wasn't before, instead of do, figuring that out, once you've collected all 51 jurisdictions laws, you can figure that out after the first 10, go back and adjust that for the first 10, and then the next 41 go you already have that um, established. That's the idea of doing this in batches, making your life easier and making the process um, easier in and of itself. Um, so this is the collecting the law process again. It's a circle because
because it's iterative, um, you, this process, as we said, you do it in batches, um, and you're going to have to go back and redo it over and over as you go through. Um, collecting law itself is the process of identifying laws that are relevant to the topic being studied um, in each jurisdiction included in the project, and then gathering important information about these laws. The goal is to identify all the laws that are necessary to answer the questions developed in each jurisdiction. Omitting a relevant law can then lead to inaccurate legal data. So the goal here, again, it's important that we want to capture all of the laws that are relevant to answering the questions that we've created um, in this process. Um, the search, as you're collecting the law, don't forget to collect citations, um, which is a reference to a specific statute or regulations that will help to identify the effective dates of those laws or policies, which is the date when a law goes into force, the statutory history, uh, what legislative session the law or amendment was enacted in, and then the actual legal text itself. Um, we need to answer the questions in the jurisdictions. We need the actual legal text. So part of this process is, um, is capturing that legal text. Um, the way we do this is through what we refer to as master sheets, um, and these are sheets that organize the laws by jurisdiction and time. Um, of a master sheet. So for each law, uh, the master sheet will then include the citation and title, the statutory history, and the effective dates. This is an example Alaska master sheet um, for, I think this is from our, actually from the Distracted Driving Project. Um, and the idea here is that there is a, a single master sheet with all of the relevant laws for each jurisdiction in the project. So if you're doing a state level project, you'll have state level plus DC, you'll have 51 master sheets in the end. Um, and the idea here is that um, we are able to then have a sheet that has all the laws in a hierarchical format um, that shows us the citation, the effective dates, et cetera. In a longitudinal process project, it's important to capture all of the um, amendment history, all of the statutory history, all of the different effective dates of each amendment so that we can track those changes over time. In a cross-sectional project, in a, um, uh, it is less important to do so um, because you're only capturing the law as it exists at that one specific point in time. Um, for a longitudinal project, you want to have the laws organized hierarchically and chronologically so that they can show their evolution over time. Um, again, uh, this includes quality control, of course, because everything in policy surveillance includes quality control. Um, what we do here is what we call redundant research. Um, similar to the process of the having two people write each of the memos, we have two researchers create master sheets for the same jurisdiction um, independently, identifying and recording those citations for that jurisdiction. The supervisor is then able to compare those two master sheets um, for, for example, Alaska. You'll have one researcher produce an Alaska master sheet and another researcher produce an Alaska master sheet. The supervisor can compare them, observe the divergences, the identical laws, comment, um, review, what, why are there divergences, what laws are missing, what should be captured, and then what this does is produce quality control um, and hopefully then will allow us to feel confident that we've collected all of the laws relevant to answering our questions in that jurisdiction. So once you've collected the law, once you've collected these citations, created your master sheet, um, we're then able to collect and create the legal text. Um, what I mean by the legal text is the organized version of the relevant law for a jurisdiction. Um, in a legal assessment or a cross-sectional project, that is going to be one legal text for one jurisdiction at a single point in time. For a policy surveillance or a longitudinal project, that will be multiple legal texts for that one jurisdiction over a period of time. And then this legal text is used to code the law. So basically the idea here is that because we're noting that the law changes over time, we need to capture the how the law looked at each, um, how the legal text itself looked at each of those uh, of changes over time so that we can then 
answer our coding questions for each of those different versions of the law itself and thereby see changes over time leading to data. Um, creating the legal text, uh, this is um, a, a sort of uh, on the ground uh, Issue: We transfer and combine the collected laws into legal text documents. Um, we create an amendment tracker, which I'll discuss briefly in the next slide, but, and that is specifically for longitudinal or policy surveillance projects, and that we use um, the amendment tracker to create one version of the legal text per change in the law over time, as I just described. Um, so this is specific. If you were doing a cross-sectional project, you just do that first step, transfer and combine the collected laws into a legal text document for each jurisdiction for that point in time. If you're doing a longitudinal or policy surveillance project, you want to create an amendment tracker, which we'll discuss, which tracks the amendments of the laws, as it might imply, and then use that amendment tracker to create a version of the law for each um, change in the law over time. Here um, is an example of an amendment tracker. Uh, this is an amendment tracker that uh, contains the following information. So this is an amendment tracker for the Alaska master sheet that um, I showed you earlier. So there's an iteration number which indicates the iteration of the law. Um, the iteration is a set of specific provisions that constitute the relevant law for a given jurisdiction and time period. Every time any provision for a jurisdiction changes, a new iteration must be created. Um, so for example, in this example, Alaska has four statutes on this topic. Um, and if any of them change, a new iteration must be created. Likewise, if a relevant law in a jurisdiction is added or removed at any time, a new iteration must be created. The first iteration is always the start date of the project. So in this example, our first iteration is January 1st, 2011, even if these laws existed prior to January 1st, 2011. Um, any sub subsequent iterations represent amendments to the relevant laws that occurred after that start date. Um, so in this example, the second iteration is on May 11, 2012, because all of the relevant laws changed on that day. They all were amended. But as you can see, the third iteration on July 1, 2012, only one of the laws changed. But even though only one of the laws was amended, we still need to collect the, the legal text for that entire iteration. Um, the date on this uh, designates the effective date for the amendment we're describing. Um, again, the objective date is the date that the legislation becomes effective in law, not the passage date or the signature date. Those are some legal details that you'll need to understand. Um, and then um, an amendment, uh, this section includes the citation for the law that is being amended on that date. And then the changes, so that amendment lists the actual law at issue, and then the changes detail what changed um, uh, in that law. The first section indicates that the detailed um, citation of the amendment, and then the, the information after that indicates uh, the nature of the change. Um, and basically, now that the law is organized hierarchically and chronologically for policy surveillance projects, it's time to actually create the legal text um, which will be used to code. I saw someone ask a question about how we actually collect, um, to how do we actually uh, find the laws? Um, uh, the issue here, so we're not going to have time in this introductory presentation to discuss um, the use of Westlaw, of the um, LexisNexis, all the other types of legal data sets on top of um, uh, legisla state legislative websites, but that is generally where we find the law, um, and we go into much more detail about that on our website and how to do that, how to create a search strategy, how to um, create a, uh, um, as I said, just how to find those laws in our advanced series on collecting the law and as well on our information. And again, I apologize for the, the beeps that you keep hearing um, that I'm not, I will figure out for next time how to turn that off. That's everyone entering and leaving the, um, the room. Um, I apologize if I'm going over, but there's a lot of information. Um, and then the idea here, again, going back to the amendment tracker, 
you use the master sheet and the amendment tracker to create longitudinal data. The master sheet citations go directly into the amendment tracker, which then directly goes into the full legal text. Um, this is an example of how these are all used together to show the evolution of law over time in a longitudinal project. Um, again, as a quick overview of how this works, the refined citations are recorded in this master sheet, which lists all relevant laws in that one jurisdiction here, Alaska. You then create the amendment tracker, um, adding an iteration for each date the law changes. Um, so here is an example of how we collect Iteration two uh, is May 11, 2012, based on the amendment on 2835-161 that went into effect on May 11, 2012. Those details are um, listed in the changes section. And then the researcher will then copy the body of the law for every citation and effect on the date listed for that iteration in hierarchical order and paste it into the legal text itself. So for um, legal text for May 11, 2012 in this example, on, although only one law changed, the 2835-161, um, we need to have all of the laws that existed in, in that moment of time, even if they hadn't changed themselves. Um, then we can code the law and answer our questions based on each of the distinct legal texts for each time period, each iteration tracked in the amendment tracker. Um, and Again, we go into much more detail on how to do this um, and the nuances of this um, sometimes can be the most complicated part in our um, specific uh, collecting the law presentation. Um, this is an example of, of how of an amendment tracker to create the legal text. We have here two versions of the law. Um, again, don't read too closely into the actual legal text here. Um, this is an example that doesn't include the changes, but um, the legal text, even though only one law itself changed here from the May 2012 version to the July 1st, 2012 version, um, we need to collect um, all of the legal text and present a snapshot of what the relevant laws looked like in Alaska on May 11, 2012 and July 1st, 2012. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Again, we have more detailed information on that. Um, uh, in on our website as well as in our um, advanced webinars. So then we move on to the fun part, actually, if you can believe it. Um, we code the law. So we use, we've gone through this whole process, we've um, done our background research, we've created our coding questions, and now we're ready and we've collected the actual legal text through the collecting the law process, and now we are ready to use that legal text to answer the questions that we've created. Um, the goal here is to read, observe, and record the law rather than reading and interpreting the law again. Um, and then we code those answers based on the collected law. So this is an example. Um, here we have a question from our, our distracted driving data set. Uh, what behaviors are restricted while driving? Handheld electronic messaging, handheld calling, hands-free electronic messaging, and hands-free calling. We've created these answer choices based on our prior research and our understanding of how the law exists across jurisdiction. Um, and now in Alaska, we can read that based on the legal text, a person commits the crime of driving while texting if the person is driving a motor vehicle and the person is reading or typing a text message on a cellular telephone. So based on that legal text, we then would answer A, uh, Alaska restricts the behavior of handheld electronic messaging. So now we are going to uh, play some more fun games and um, some coding question examples with legal text. So this comes from a project on um, legalized marijuana laws across um, the United States. And so this asks how much marijuana may an in-state resident purchase, one ounce, two ounces, or three ounces, or four ounces. Give you a minute to read the actual text at issue, um, and then I'll show you, I'll tell you the answer. So as you can see, um, that, that one at the bottom says that anyone over 21 um, is, uh, it is not criminal or a civil offense to possess, use, display, purchase, or transport marijuana accessories or one ounce or less of marijuana. So here, 
I would use that um, legal text to answer one ounce in this to this question. Uh, this, this example comes from our, our project on cottage food operations, which are, if you don't know it, it is basically the idea of people being able to sell food out of their house or out of their home kitchen. Um, Cal so a lot of states limit the, the amount of sales for a cottage food operation. So here, um, $25,000 in sales, 35000 45000 and 50000 in gross sales are potential answers. And here we have California's legal text on this. Um, and you'll note that this is a slightly tricky answer, slight trick question. Um, hopefully you'll note at the top that we're talking about the 2015 record here. So this is an example of how a coding question answer can change over time in a longitudinal project without any actual even um, amendment occurring. So here in California, uh, they defined a, they limited sales um, based on the year. So here in our 2015 record, the answer choice would be $50,000 because as it says at the bottom, commencing in 2015 and each subsequent year thereafter, the enterprise shall not have more than $50,000 in gross annual sales. This will then be useful in a longitudinal project where we've previously answered um, the amounts for 2013, 2014, and so we can see how that changed over time. And this is an example where you will need new iterations for each of those years, even if there's no actual amendment to the law there because we want to capture those changes over time built into law itself. Here is an example from our project on emergency commitment. Um, it asks in New, York, what, in New York, what is the duration of emergency commitment? Um, and you can see that in New York Mental Hygiene Law 940, um, the director of any comprehensive emergency program, psychiatric emergency program, may retain for a period not to exceed 72 hours. Here the answer would be 72 hours. Um, this comes from our medical marijuana data set. Um, what does the state require on medical marijuana labels? Uh, ingredients for edibles, warnings to abstain from operating machinery, amount of usable marijuana, potent, product potency, and safety risks. Give you another moment to look at this. So hopefully you're able to see that 7C um, says THC concentration and CBD concentration of the marijuana. And here we would know that while this isn't um, word for word one of the answer choices listed here, this relates to product potency, which is D, our answer choice. Um, and this is something that would be explained in our research protocol. We would explain then we coded product potency whenever the THC concentration or CBD concentration of, mar of the medical marijuana must be included on the label. And in that way, when we'll know and the user of the data will know what we mean by product potency and why we're coding it here. In addition, because this is a categorical question, we would also code safety risks based on, on D, on the section D, medically and scientifically accurate information about the health and safety risks posed by marijuana. So here, the answer is both D and E. Um, and again, so those are just some quick uh, examples of how coding law works with legal text based using the questions developed. Just like every other step in the process, quality control pervades, um, and we do everything twice. To do, and so we do redundant coding. In the same way we have two researchers research the same jurisdiction, we will have two researchers code and answer the questions with the same legal text for the same jurisdiction. That way, um, the supervisor can then review the responses of both coders, find the identical responses, find, more importantly, the divergent responses. We then get together, we discuss those divergent responses, come up with um, uh, conclusions for what is the right answer choice here. Um, and then the supervisor is then able to track and calculate divergence rates by downloading the coding data or, um, or using um, some formulas uh, to figure out how our divergence rate is and how it gets, hopefully gets better over time and, and uh, um, while, we, while we get more comfortable with the, with the project. In addition to redundant coding, the supervisor should also check the records for um, general, you know, making sure everything has a citation, making sure all the questions are answered as um, we go through this process. 
And then finally, once you finish all, you know, for example, in this, in a state level one, all 51 uh, coding, all 51 jurisdictions coding, we then do statistical quality control, which is where um, we randomly select unique coding instances, assign a redundant coder who has worked on the project and has background, um, or at least has read the research protocol to redundantly code those instances. Um, and then that way we can then hopefully have a total um, divergence rate for the entire data set once it's finalized. Um, in addition to this final data check by the supervisor, the supervisor should also look for outlier responses. We're going to delete any responses that aren't um, answered at all. Maybe we had, we expected um, a question to be answered one way and we found that no law answers the question that way. We're going to get rid of that answer choice because it's not useful data anymore. Um, any outlier responses, maybe there's some weird answers, some caution notes. Um, caution notes, uh, as you would learn in our detailed coding the law. Um, are basically ways of noting when things aren't exactly matching up with the responses that, uh, that we've built in the standard question development table. You then also should find any unanswered questions, missing citations, and missing time periods. And then finally, you want to public, publicize that data and publish it. Don't let it sit in a drawer, share it with the world. Um, you can write evaluation studies with that data, legal data paper, analyzing just the data itself, publish that data online. Um, we, if you have individual projects that you are working on um, that you want published to Law Atlas, we also um, work with outside researchers to publish that on our website as long as you're meeting our policy surveillance standards and protocols. Um, and we can also help you find other ways to find your audience. And so finally, afterwards, hopefully you're not done. Maybe you did a cross-sectional data set and now you want to turn that into a longitudinal data set. Or you want to either go back in time or track how the law keeps changing as time moves forward. In that way, um, an important aspect is tracking and updating the law. You want to monitor changes to the law using alerts on Google or a search engine. Um, or have a set time for every six months, every year, we're going to update the project. And then when there is a new law, new iterations can be created and then coded for those jurisdictions. And you can see how the law changes again over time and make a more robust policy realm process. So in summary, I apologize for keeping you a little too long, but legal epidemiology is the scientific study and deployment of law as a factor in the cause, distribution, and prevention of disease and injury in a population, policy around for assessments, Public health law practice is the application of professional and legal skills and the development of health policy and practice of public health. It includes legal scans and legal profiles. And then policy surveillance, what we talked about in detail today, tracks public health laws and policies over time and across jurisdiction and uses a rigorous scientific process to create data for evaluation and empirical research. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at the Policy Surveillance Program. Um, this is our email address. Call us, tweet at us, um, email me. Um, we are happy to help and we want, the goal here is we want people to be doing policy surveillance. We want this process out there in the world. Um, so we encourage your use of it and any questions you have in any way that we can help. As I mentioned at the top, we have a, this is the introductory um, version webinar. So basically this was, as you just went through, a broad overview of the process. We didn't talk about a lot of the details that go in. Um, and those details will be discussed in our advanced series. And now that all of you have, have finished the intro, you're, you're very much primed and ready for the advanced series of the webinar. Um, and in that way, um, we actually, I think the first one is next Tuesday. Um, and it's over the course of the next few months. You'll find that in the same information where you found this registration. Additionally, every summer, we also have a summer institute, which basically pushes all of those um, advanced webinars into a two-day seminar of intensive policy surveillance training. Um, so you could come next, next summer. Um, it's actually, um, oh yeah, no, sorry, the, the first advanced webinar is not next week, it's the 27th, I apologize. Um, uh, and, but, 27th at 11 a.m. Um, it should be listed on, uh, on our website and on our information. If you need help signing up for it, 
feel free to ask. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to chat at me now. I'll stick around for a bit to answer any that you have. Um, otherwise, have a great rest of your day, and thank you for joining us for this webinar today. And yes, uh, the sending out this recording to everyone who registered. Thank you.